<laughs> Welcome to the Healing Arts Encounters in Arts and Medicine here at the Berlin University of the Arts. Um, I, Lucas Fires, I'm very thrilled to have two wonderful guests with us tonight. Uh, that is uh, Professor Do Dr. Dr. Susanne Bauer, who is actually from the UDK, Berlin, and she's Professor for Music Therapy at the Berlin Career College. Um, she is a graduate psychologist, a music therapist, and a systemic couple and family therapist. Uh, Susanne Bauer received her doctorate on the topic of music therapy, emotions, perception, and schizophrenia. And she's currently working on a treatment concept for therapeutic group music therapy at the Wiegmann Clinic of the DRK Clinic in West End, the clinic for psychotherapy and psychosomatics. So thank you so much for being here. And along with Susanne, we have Dr. Friedemann Schad who is head of the Havel Höhe Oncology Center, a senior physician in interdisciplinary oncology and support of medicine, the deputy, Medi deputy medical director and managing director of the Gemeinschaftskrankenhaus Havel Höhe. Um, we have a story that goes back a couple of years, um, uh, Friedemann, because uh, in a way um, my uh, uh, kind of exploration of the encounters of arts and medicine started on invitation of um, your hospital uh, a few years back where I um, was invited to organize two internal workshops with the Krankenhausleitung more or less, no? with the direction of the, the hospital on the topic of art and medicine where I invited different um, artists and curators, among them by the way Prem Krishnamurti who was here the last time and, and other collectives to think along how this could be integrated and what could be done with it. Um, and from this, I kind of started to get more and more interested. So I'm very, very thankful that you are joining us today here at the UDK. That said, um, as always, I would like to, I'd like to start with the medical part and then we go into, quote unquote, the arts. Um, so Friedemann Schad, um, please give him a warm applause while I prepare the PowerPoint. <laughs> Yeah, good late afternoon. Uh, thank you, Lucas Fireeyes, for the warm welcoming and the introduction and for inviting us and me tonight. Um, as we were walking in through this impressive building, UDK, uh, I thought, um, as I'm asked to talk about art and medicine, I thought uh, I might bring beer to Munich. So. Please excuse if you know already everything I'm bringing tonight. Um, as um, Lukas Feierreis already said, um, I'm a medical doctor. I'm responsible for quite a large department uh, specialized in oncology. That means dealing with cancer uh, uh, around the whole care continuum, what we call today and also responsible for a palliative ward. That's what I'm doing basically in my daily work. Um, the hospital Havelhöhe is run by a integrative concept and I thought I bring it very practically and tell you a little bit what we do in daily care and have some two or three slides about studies at the end and then the discussion will be the main point I understood. Yeah, first of all, two or three slices on the, uh, uh, the hospital. We are what we call Regel- und Basisversorgung, that means a basis supply or medical supply in the western southern part of Berlin. We are involved and these are all our departments. And as you see, we have quite a large internal department on cardiology, pneumology, oncology, but we also have some acute departments like intensive care and first aid department, psychosomatic, chronic pain, addiction board, and uh, surgery and gynecology as well. So that is what we offer um, and we are involved in the basic supply, as I said already. Um, integrative medicine is a term we have brought up in the last decade 
maybe a bit longer already. In earlier times, we called it CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, meaning that there is something to add based on the achievements of conventional or what we also call natural science-based medicine, guideline-based medicine. There are some aspects to add on top of this, and this is often called then in integrative medicine. I'm not going into that too much because there are different definitions, but one definition I want to point out to you because there's this wonderful book written by Tobias from Esch and Benno Brinkhaus, also from the Charité, and also they wrote it in an article. And I only want to bring this, read this out very briefly. Integrative medicine and health reaffirms the importance of the relationship between practitioner and patient, focuses on the whole person, is informed by evidence, and makes use of all appropriate therapeutic, preventive, health-promoting or lifestyle approaches. Healthcare professionals and disciplines to achieve optimal health and healing emphasizing the art and science of healing. It is based on a social and democratic as well as a natural and healthy environment. And I suggest you, maybe this is an idea to continue, continue to deal with for you in the future. And I want to focus once more, emphasizing the art and science of healing. That is something very interesting. In earlier definitions about integrative medicine, the term art was not there and is brought into here because it points out something important, maybe. Anthroposophic medicine is a concept of integrative medicine. There are others as well. And I just showed you here some kind of therapies which we offer the patient in our daily care. Of course, you have uh, rem uh, remedies, medication, uh, surgery, and all I mentioned already, but physiotherapy, rhythmical massage, nursing approaches, eurythmy therapy, this is something like uh, uh, moving therapy, sculpturing, music therapy, painting, speech, and psychotherapy. And this is offered to any, in any department of a hospital, to any kind of diagnose, one could say. And I give you uh, some examples. For example, rhythmical massage. In other circumstances, you would might call it touch therapy uh, or other. It's actually something uh, which is very calm and uh, um, which is not a cognitive therapy. You don't think during that. You almost fell asleep and you relax and you are touched to your body. Yeah, there's a kind of bathing as well. Nursing interventions, I think this is uh, quite unique in uh, this concept. Compresses, wrappings, embrocations, massages done by nurses, meaning that nurses have a therapeutic instrumentarium themselves. They even give the indication themselves and uh, bring it to the patient. Eurythmic therapy, I mentioned it, you can do it in the group or alone. Um, in German, you say Achtsamkeitsbasierte Bewegung Therapy. Achtsamkeitsbasierte Bewegung Therapy. Mm. Painting, I come to that in the end again. Mm. Uh, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm giving only this example. Somebody who, was, uh, who had a, a lady who had a breast cancer, first picture and after some course of the treatment, um, the last picture. And there has been a process in between. Um, it's obvious. Modeling, that means working in clay or working with wood or even working with stone is also possible. Music, 
with different music, uh, music instruments. It can be um, in a group as well as a, as a single treatment, breathing therapy. And this summarizes and gives an important aspect. The idea is not everybody gets everything and that is very good medicine. The idea is based on a multimodal concept. This is a multimodal concept. Individual, an individual approach is developed together with the patient. Uh, that is the basic idea. <coughs> Are we doing it in our daily care? This is a small study. It's a bit some years ago, we published, published this in 2017, and we were just looking at all those patients who entered the breast cancer center. We have a certified, by the German Cancer Society, certified breast cancer center. And all these patients who then undergo treatment and operations were asked, did you get these kinds of therapies actually during your first stay? which is between five and seven days staying in hospital. It's not very long. And this is the result from more than 700 patients at that time. Now we have much more, of course. And if you see the massage is more, almost 100% gets this massage application during the first day. The same, of course, very important psycho-oncological support. Movement therapies as eurythmic therapy, for example, 90%, nursing interventions, almost 90%, art therapy, almost 80%. I think it uh, shows quite well that this kind of treatment can be implemented in daily care of a certified breast cancer center. Um, out of many studies there are on different topics, I choose this one. And I want to go with you uh, with it very short. With you, it has been published 2019. It's um, from a British group, and actually they showed at a cohort. They looked at a cohort from actually healthy people, and followed this cohort 14 day, 14 years. Mm, the adults who were included had to be. 50 or older from age. And then they looked at very different parameters, healthy parameters, movement, educational things, um, and also at their cultural behavioral. Have they been to concerts, to a museum, and other cultural activities? And we are talking about more than 6,700 patient who were included. Yes, it's not a randomized controlled trial, it is what we call observational study. So from the method point of view, it's not a confirmatory result, but still it's an interesting result. Cultural events, museum visits, art exhibitions, theater, opera performances. And uh, what was the result? People who engaged in artistic activities once or twice a year in this cohort, interestingly, had a 14% lower risk of death during the follow-up compared to those who never engaged in these activities. Interesting. And if you do it more than twice a year, People who engage frequently, more frequently, every few months or more in artistic activities had a 31% lower risk of death in this um, time. Regardless of demographic, socioeconomic, health-related, behavioral or social factors. So I'm not answering the reason why it is like this, but it's a, a remarkable result to think about what impact does these uh, activities have on us. Yeah, 
of course, as some of us are involved in research uh, since many years, and also research in art um, and other therapies are um, growing, which is very good, still, uh, it's not so easy sometimes, and it's complicated. And here is why, because the human being, of course, is a very complex being. For example, cancer, but other illnesses as well, are also very complex diseases. Integrative medicine are complex interventions. Which of this intervention I showed you would have worked on this single patient? So that means also scientifically we need a complex system of approach. And sometimes it is called mixed method approach, which just merely says we need different methods to, to come closer to reality. I come to an end and want just very shortly and briefly to describe something. Um, uh, uh, once a patient told me, cancer patient, male patient, told me, why should I go for painting? Uh, you know, my cancer will not go away if I paint today. And um, of course he was right, but still I invited him to go to the therapy and as you are the experts in this process, I might can make it very short, but um, which I learned the last years, this moment uh, to me seems to be very, very important. You know, if you have a, uh, uh, a strong diagnose, this overrules us sometimes, makes us mindless. And then comes medicine and says, you go for this, you go for this, you go for this, and let's go for radiation, and then for chemo. Sometimes we feel again, might less, or we feel helped, of course, as well, but um, we lose activity, we lose self-competence, or we are in the danger, at least, to lose it. And our therapy, if we stand in front of a paper, and then we have to choose, what am I going to do, which color, which kind of material I'm going to work, uh, a pencil, how am I going to do it? Already something very important starts. It starts a process. It is starting an individual process in everybody, in each of us, in a different way but we are invited for a creative process, a productive process. This can also be difficult, but at least it's an invitation to be in an in a encounter moment with myself, to be uh, in a moment with what am I doing, emotionally, cognitive. So something is on the way, and this feeling of creativity might be a very helpful uh, support for many patients um, during the course of therapy. That's what I'm offering to think about. Not knowing that Professor Willig is here tonight, I only wanted to mention this is um, a Congress of Integrative Medicine uh, which has been created many years ago. And last September it was in Rome, and it's actually the 15th European Congress on Integrated Medicine founded by Professor Willig in Berlin. And I wanted those of you who are interested in it, next year it was planned in Jerusalem, but um, just before this session, to this afternoon, there was a planning session that it will not be held in Jerusalem out of understandable reasons. So there will be another town to choose, but still there's a lot of research going on in this field and some of you might be interested and might be visiting this. Thank you for the interest. Thank you so much, Friedemann. Very enlightening presentation. And now we come to you, uh, Susanne Bauer. I'll pass you the mic and I'll open the slide for you. Yeah. 
And off you go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you very much also for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and to share with you some of uh, our ideas about music, music therapy, healing, and arts. And um, it was really difficult to choose which, what topic would I prefer to share and to, uh, show to you. And uh, when we discussed uh, one, year, uh, one week before, um, I realized that many of you maybe, probably, do not know uh, that there is a music therapy program at the UDK Berlin. So I start with this. What? But it's so it's so shiny. Okay, okay. <laughs> I try to avoid it. Okay. Um, so my first um, slide uh, tells you that music therapy as a study uh, at the UDK Berlin is very old. Um, my colleague, Professor Karin Schumacher, she started with this program at uh, 1984 a long time ago, and she had four years uh, trial, uh, four years. Um, the president at that time, he wanted her very much to put music therapy in the faculty of music. Um, <clears throat> so after four years, um, she had her program ready and uh, enough people to start with. So in 1988 until 2007, um, we had this diploma program in music therapy. Um, our residence is Mirendorf Platz, since ever. And the head of the program was uh, the first 10 years, more or less, Professor Karin Schumacher. Then came a second professor, Professor Jan Langenberg. And they had together uh, the joint um, chief leadership uh, for the program. And then in 2007, in 2007, um, the Berlin Carrier, uh, how it is, ZIW, Zentral Institut für Weiterbildung, was founded. Uh, this is our Weiterbildungsinstitut, a postgraduate institute. Uh, so then it was decided to uh, take off music therapy from the Faculty of Music and to make it a, a, a master program. So since then, uh, it's a it's a postgraduate study master program which runs about three years, and um, uh, people end up with a master of arts in music therapy. Uh, actually, and since 2008, I'm the leader of this program, and together with Professor Dorothea Mutesius, we try to do our best to um, bring up very good music therapists. Uh, Internationally, um, we have 30% of our students are from abroad, um, but we teach in German language because uh, all the students, they have to do a sort of practicum, hospitation, and they have to do this in Germany or in German-speaking places. So they have to speak with the patients, with clients, in German language, most of them. This is the base, uh, that's why I'm here. Um, I myself, I studied music therapy at that time, a long time ago, in Vienna, which was the first place where you could st uh, study music therapy in German language. And after that, I studied psychology in Rome. So uh, I was happy to see Rome again. Um, and then I go, uh, went abroad to South America, Chile, and there I built up a program, music therapy program, a master program in Chile, which is still going on. I'm very happy about that. And I came back 2008, 2009 to Germany, and I found myself being the director of this program. And I am very happy with that until now. Um, I brought to you now um, a little example, two little examples. One is from individual music therapy. Um, my specialty is uh, adults. Uh, adults in psychotherapeutic context and psychosomatic context or psychiatric patients. <coughs> I'm working at a, uh, in a clinic a uh, few hours a week, but so still I'm seeing patients, groups and individuals uh, and make music therapy with them. And this is an example from a woman about, she was 60 years old and it was individual music therapy. And what I want you to listen and to pay attention to is how the patient, she plays on the big uh, xylophone or metallophone, 
um, um, engages with the piano or vice versa. So you will listen to two people, but there will be a third instrument played also by the patient. So I hope this will work now. Uh, somebody can help me to move this. Uh, I don't want to do it wrong. Ah, just with the pet. Oh, no. 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 <laughs> yes, okay. This is two minutes and a half. It's a patient. Carefully, and um, you listened how they engaged uh, to each other. Maybe later we can have more questions about this example. Um, and you saw how it shaped some rhythm, some melody, and how they came together. The patient normally have no, not much clue about music. Uh, mo some of them have no idea uh, about playing music. Some of them have. We have also patients who are m musicians, and it's not easier with them. It's difficult. Uh, music therapy um, happens in dialogue and it's proces processual. So you have will never have a, a sort of immediate change in a person. Uh, you will have a relationship, a music therapeutic relationship between patient and uh, the therapist. So you need time to develop uh, emotions, uh, thoughts, feelings, and uh, confidence, so uh, especially. Uh, music therapy enables perception, expression of emotion, and shaping of mental structure, uh, which is very important. Promotes aesthetics perception within a creative process, which was uh, sort of mentioned before by Professor Schad. The creativity is very important. And I found out that um, a lot of these factors um, has to do with aesthetics. So the basic aesthetic factors, aesthesis, catharsis, and poesis, are reflected in a the music therapeutic process. Um, aesthesis 
is the perception of sensations and ideas. It means hearing, listening, seeing and watching and feeling. It's about self-awareness and introspection. Then we have catharsis, which is emotional relief. Effective discharge, identification and communication individual and collective cleansing experiences and cultural experiences, um, awareness of others. And paresis, which is very important, is bringing out and shaping, connecting experiences, structured experiences of reality. That means bringing together inside and outside and bringing together people, uh, which was also the example from the last two, uh, two weeks ago it seems to be when they were singing, so they were shaping, they were um, um, feeling together some sort of melody and song. So each of them and all together cause a sense of coherence and I have this uh, theory or hypothesis that the sense of coherence is really psychologically necess uh, necessary. Uh, Rorty, which is an author, calls it a comprehensible whole, so the whole the whole of us, the inside and the outside, and being on my own and being together with others, this makes a sense of coherence and a sense of coherence um, strengthens identity and integrates different aspects of the self and others. So my question is, does music, music therapy and the other arts promote a sense of coherence? I think I will answer it with yes, but this is a very nice uh, discussion point and research point. So psychodynamic music therapy um, needs a, a few ingredients, which is a therapist, a music therapist, a patient and musical material, which is instruments or the voice. Um, I say uh, it's necessary that there's a music therapist because um, music therapy, we have no uh, law about music therapy, so everybody can call himself or herself music therapist. Um, it's not uh, regulated by the, our law. Um, but there are a lot of uh, universities where you can study it profoundly. Um, the therapeutic process um, is playing, perceiving, experiencing and reflecting together. When I work with my patients, we improvise, we play and then we speak about that. We uh, reflect what does this have to do with me? Why I, am I playing only three notes? Or why I am playing so confusing notes? Or why I am reducing myself on one only single note? And this has to do with the psychic, psychological or mental structure, the emotions of our patients, which project their um, problems into the instruments and into the sounds. Uh, so we have this relationship, this very important relationship and a sort of triangulation process, which the music is outside, it's the bridge between patient and um, patient and therapist, but it's also the bridge between inside and outside of the patient himself. Uh, when we work on the so-called mental structure of our patients, uh, we need them uh, or we have to um, mm, yeah, produce exper new experiences uh, to promote perceiving new experiences. Um, also the control aspect is very important that the person can stop the music, he can start the music. So the self-efficacy is very important. The field of connecting, bonding, um, being together with others is experienced in music therapy, in group therapy and also in individual therapy and creating and shaping uh, structures. Um, I will jump over this. Uh, it's another music but maybe we are very uh, slow on time and then we could do it maybe later. And um, we have also other type of patients which have a conflict, a personal conflict, neurotic conflict. So music therapy instruments and the group session serves to these people to experience their conflict uh, to make conscious their conflicts, to work out and to, to cope with the conflicts and speak about them. So, uh, for example, autonomy and dependency is a basic conflict and a lot of people have this um, conflict and they want to be autonomous but uh, they are still not able to leave the place, leave the house because they also need uh, to, they feel a sort of dependency from parents, from other people. 
So you can experience this in the group music therapy, but also in individual music therapy, trying it out with instruments, with sounds coming together, separating yourself from others and making new experiences. So these slides don't work. Uh, conclusion, <coughs> music therapists grasp, grasp the relational events playing together with the patients, which is different to maybe art therapists, uh, which uh, they are the patients they paint on themselves. And music therapist almost, the music therapist almost always plays together with his patients or her patients. By allowing the therapist uh, themselves to be moved in and along, by allowing themselves to be surprised and by discovering together. Uh, we, have no, we are not running a program. We are not thinking, oh, next session I will try that the patient's plays only uh, dissonances or only harmonious sounds. Uh, we don't have a plan. So we always react um, to, to the person which is in front of us, to the group. They're always surprises. You cannot plan a therapeutic session. It's very difficult. You have a hypothesis, you have an idea, um, you are aware of the needs of your patient, but what will happen exactly, you cannot uh, plan this beforehand. Then music therapists recognize and serve the early implicit needs of their patients, such as attachment, bonding, or self-efficacy or grasp their in conflictual relationship offers, such as hate, love, or shame. Uh, lots of my patients are very ashamed. They don't want to listen to themselves. Um, they don't want to produce a sound. They're very ashamed. But by the time uh, they get more self-conscious, self-aware, and they receive from others uh, feedback um, about their sounds, which are very nice, which are very... Um, other pa patients may be pleased by the sounds, but the patient himself might find his uh, his own sounds very awful. So there's a um, contradiction be between self-awareness and awareness of others. So this we try to match this. Uh, also um, to promote self-coherence. Um, process of processes of change are reflected in musical activity and in the choice of instruments. Change of perspective turns unpopular instruments into favorite ones. Uh, very often patients um, don't want to play the piano, don't want to play the gong, don't want to play instruments which they think they might be too loud. And after two or three weeks they love these instruments because they realize that it depends on them if a gong is loud or the piano is loud. Uh, so um, they they learn to, to, um, to control what they want to do and integrate their fears and understand their fears, their irrational fears, really. So um, I'm ready at up to this point, but I'm very open to more questions about the clinical or the study aspects of music therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you, for the introduction. Um, as I said before, I'll break the ice. I'll ask you first a few couple of questions, and then it's really um, you're very much invited to to join uh, the conversation. Um, yeah, there was a lot of food for thought uh, in both of your presentations. I took a lot of notes, and and I'm very grateful for for today's input. Um, so maybe let's start at the very beginning with the definition of integrative medicine that you Friedemann showed us in that one sentence that you highlighted: the arts. The art and science of healing, um, and here in this uh, series so far, we've often discussed, um, yeah, what I mean. It's also the title of the art uh, of the series, uh, the healing arts. But what really is healing, or what what really is health? Big questions. Um, so, <laughs> as a kind of a warm up, um, let's start with um, how you. How you how you work with that definition, the art and science of healing, and what really is healing to you in your day-to-day -day practice? 
and that goes for both of you. And whoever dares to go first goes first. <laughs> I know. Yes. So that is the the uh, what is it called the one billion dollar question in one in ninety seconds. Mm. Um, uh, over the over the years, I learned that healing happens on different levels. There is not one level, and we say that's healing. For example, we have a kind of which is more physically body-based. If you have a fracture of the leg, you hope somebody comes and fix it. That's part of a healing aspect, isn't it? So, or you have a heart attack and you go in an acute hospital and you get a heart catheter and this is a rather mechanical intervention but it helps you to overcome this heart attack. This is also a kind of therapy towards the chance of healing. Then there's another level for me, which is more regenerative medicine, regenerative medicine. That means good food, movement, uh, chronobiomedicine, sleeping a lot, hygienic parts of my life to support regeneration, to support healing. Yeah. And then there's a, maybe a third level like what is actually healthy for my soul, for my emotional being, for my personal development, and there are different aspects which can be uh, support me in this. And maybe there's another level for, um, which is even a more personal one. Um, each of us has a center, a personal center. And where am I going? What are my aims? What is the arc of my life, the melody of life? This is more than only uh, an emotional aspect, this is a deeper, more deeper aspect. And these are different levels who need to be looked after, who need to be cared in a good medical concept. Thank you. And, uh, some few more words also. Um, I think it's, I don't use very much this word, uh, because it's a very high expectative when you, um, promise the patient you will heal him, her or her, and or the patient asks you, "Will you heal me? He heal me?" And I say, "I cannot give this promise. I cannot heal you, but I can maybe I can uh, accompany you and makes you make you feel better in some senses." My patients are um, more psychical, um, touched by psychic crisis. Uh, but some of them have also aches in psychosomatic. We have uh, headaches and uh, stomach aches. And um, of course, these people, they feel better if the headaches or aches uh, disappear. So they feel they, are, they got healed. But the soul, it's not so easy to heal the soul, which, is very, what's, which was very hurt during 20 or 30 years. So people come when they're 30, 35, with a depression, anxious states, and you cannot heal them from today to tomorrow. So you just be with this person and offer him, and stay for him, listen to him or her, and very often people feel better if you just dedicate time to them, if you remember their names, if you ask them a few questions, because never ever anybody had done that before. So I think that it's not healing, but it's um, make them feel better, I think, which, which this is what the patients tell us. I just, I already feel a little bit better. But, but they don't say, I feel you healed me. Oh. Please add to it. Listening to her, it came something to my mind. Um, I fully agree. It's not so easy to talk about healing, especially if we are in cancer field. Uh, even in palliative care, which is often the end of life care aspect, um, there's an, uh, a term we say autonomy. Uh, to, to save and support and respect any level of autonomy is something which has an, a healing, respectful uh, aspect. I just want to bring that in. Yeah. To support autonomy in each and everybody um, is a very important goal. 
autonomy has been actually one of my talking points here as well. Uh, there's two, but we can also go to, uh, I would be interested in the relational aspect because that went, was mentioned so often. Also you just said, if you remember the name, if you ask questions, it's kind of building up a relationship now. Um, and then autonomy, that's another point. But maybe let's pick up the autonomy now and then we come to the relations again um, and elaborate a little bit on this because you presented uh, the blank canvas in your last two slides as an invitation to <coughs> contribute, to be part of it, to actually regain autonomy, often in situations yes. where you feel helped, yet also helpless. Um, so, um, and you, your term was self-efficacy, efficacy, <laughs> um, or whatever, however you pronounce it, similar kind of idea. Maybe that's something that both of you I would like to invite to elaborate on. I can start because I mentioned also the, 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 this word and the state uh, autonomy, uh, which is a very early uh, in the um, in the development of a child. Autonomy is a very important point, and there are so many uh, children who cannot develop good enough in autonomy because or they are repressed or they are too early autono autonomous. But it's not a real autonomy when they are isolated or when they are left alone which is a false autonomy. So the de developing the process of autonomy, we say it's only uh, possible in relation to others. The, the so-called process of individuation depends on the uh, existence of other people. You cannot develop individuation uh, on your own. So um, I think in group therapy, the people can f on one side uh, experience themselves, their um, own self and uh, make decisions which instrument do I want to play, how do I want to play, but then they come together with the person, uh, the other uh, group members and they could, how can I with my way of being and with my autonomous need um, come together with others and uh, because the other people also want their autonomy. So this is very tricky. Um, because you cannot, um, um, you must, in, in group therapy, you cannot, uh, how do you say, was heißt fördern? Fördern? Support. Uh, support. Uh, uh, the only or just the individual development. You have to integrate the individual and the group uh, thing. Um, so far. And autonomy, I think, well, uh, all these things we uh, want to um, teach or how do you know, um, heal in our patients, uh, we are, it's very important that we ourselves uh, have these skills. So when you have therapists who, have, who don't experience autonomy, uh, this is very dangerous because they will live this in the relationship later. I mean, I've got this one. You are autonomous. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, I, I could add um, in the following way: when we when we listen to the music, and also how how you explained it then on the slides, slides, um, it's an invitation. This kind of art is an invitation of opening a new room, and uh, this room can also be risky. I can fail but still I'm step into it if, if I'm a successful if, or if I can step into it. And I think this is a very, very important and helpful movement in many circumstances, especially also in medicine, because renewing ourselves, having a heavy, heavy diagnosis to deal with, there are many, many aspects, there's a lot of science around, yes, but one of the most important aspects is how do I overcome and I identify myself with a new future. So that is also something about healing to support um, like birth giving. The, the, the patient, he or herself, they heal themselves, isn't it? We are only giving circumstances. So in the best way, we might be uh, um, hebam. Uh, what is hebam in English? Huh? Midwife. Midwives. It's, it's a, pro a process of being a midwifery and going this risky situation and then gaining 
and uh, experiencing himself or herself in a new identity. That's what I read in you and what, what I understood what you are doing music as well. And actually a beautiful point that you just made um, about autonomy, that it only happens in relation. Um, so autonomy not in the sense of an isolation, but in a relation in the group or also between the patient and the therapist or the healthcare worker or the, or the medical doctor or the family. And anyways, the, the, the term relation has appeared in both of your presentations, also in the definition of uh, integrative medicine that you mentioned in the beginning by Benno Brinkhaus, who was here also as a guest. Um, is the part the relationship between the patient and the, I don't know what the term was used, therapist or medical doctor? And uh, you spoke of constructing relationships, uh, you spoke of the re relational events, and um, we actually in the arts we have the re rela relational aesthetics, I don't know if you've come across that, or relational art, but that's um, kind of a form of art, or practice of art, that, are, that kind of look at the whole human relations and their kind of social context and what they do. So there the artist is more of a catalyst uh, than anything else. It's a term coined by Nicolas Bourriot, Relational aesthetics, relational art, but in a way you are both uh, practicing relational arts. Um, but I would like to reflect mm -hmm. on that relation a little bit more. Yeah, maybe this example from this patient was good because, uh, as you said, uh, the person has to there, she has to try herself out and because it's a risk. because. Uh, nor me, myself, nor the patient, we know what will happen when she started and when I start or when the, uh, the therapist starts with the piano. Um, so the, I think the condition to, to go into this risk is the relationship. Um, when the patient is very unsure and he or she feels unsafe, I think um, he's very timid and he will not go into this improvisation act, which is uh, uncertain. And um, this has to do with, I think this is another thing we may speak later uh, with the group about it, uh, playing. The fact uh, there are adults who not, are not more able to play, because if you go into a play, playing, mental playing, um, how do you say, situation, you know you will risk because you may, may lose yourself playing. Like the children, the children just go into a play and they don't listen anything anymore, but we adults are very controlled and if you have a depression or if you have a, a, a diagnosis, um, then playing is very difficult. So um, the relationship, the confidence is very important to have somebody beside you, which you know he or she, the therapist, will be, is with you. It uh, doesn't matter what you will do and there's no mistake. This is very important and, uh, that the patients feel that the music, they cannot do mistakes, that everything they do is okay, it's fine, because it comes out of, of them. This is my opinion to a relationship. Yeah. Uh, actually, we cannot not interact. We cannot not interact. As soon as we uh, come into a room, we already have interacted with one another. And that is also uh, in, in medicine, if on in therapy, of course, it has something to do with ourselves. And um, sometimes I say or discuss with my colleagues, am as a therapist, or as a doctor, am I part of a problem or am I part of a solution? Uh, even if I, if I ha had a night duty and I'm very tired, so maybe I'm not so present in encountering with the patient. So I may be a problem that morning. Uh, uh, but um, um, I ask sometimes myself, am I inspiring? Is my, is my habitus, is my uh, attitude actually inspiring in the way we have discussed before? In an invitation to the future, in an invitation to the new, or in an invitation to be more self-confident for the patient, to judge his situation the right way. 
And this is also a, a, part, a part of relationship, isn't it? Yeah, beautiful. And I mean, so many topics, but one that I would be curious about, since both of you work clinically, um, and maybe that's something um, that you can, um, that's worthwhile sharing with us um, of, I don't know, certain biggest learnings of, uh, um, of your work in, in day-to-day -day clinical um, ex uh, confrontation with patients, things that have you surprised you. I mean, it's been decades, I guess, for both of you that you've been working there. Um, so what have, over these decades, in this connection of art and health, um, your, biggest, yeah, your biggest learnings, for the good and for the bad, you mentioned failure. Entering that room is always the risk to fail or to, of success or autonomy or coherence. But um, what are the first things that come to mind? Maybe important to be able to wait, to not talk all the time, to be silent and to have uh, patience and no pressure to the people because sometimes the development is so slow, so little. And then I'm surprised when after a few weeks, a person who I thought he, he or she would never ever do a, a step in na forward, forward uh, will do it. And um, this may be love, an instrument which he or she before hated, or play a structure when he was very confused before. Uh, these little things, uh, and you just feel them. You must not o always um, give them back or give a feedback. Sometimes it's enough if you don't um, talk about these things, but you just um, realize, oh, there happened a lot of important things. Um, I'm thinking about uh, errors. Um, yeah, sometimes when I'm, for example, uh, um, um, a person, a patient chooses an instrument and I have my cognitive, my brain is still on cognition and not an, on emotion. And then I say to him, oh, do, why don't you take two sticks instead of one? Or um, to give some uh, tip, tip? Suggestion? Yeah, suggestion, because we shouldn't give suggestions. We should just let it be as the patient will do it. And then afterwards, I try to understand things and not be so uh, hurrying up in situations. Therapy is slow. And by the way, you guys can get ready now, no? So there's <laughs> one more follow-up, but then it's on you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you said become silent. Uh, I, I could say give learning to give room yeah. for this process. On the other hand, of course, there are different expectations from side of the patient, different expectations, different levels. And one expectation is, of course, also being very competent in the field, in this field or in that field. If you go to a surgeon, he might be in a bad mood. As long as he is doing the operation well, you are quite happy. So there's also a high expectation in our society on the quality of medical or scientific competence, which is right. Um, uh, um. On the other hand is to encounter, patients want to be seen. Uh, they want to, they feel from the, from the first moment, do you take them serious, yes or no? Are you really interested or are you in a hurry? So to build a, to build a bottom of trust, and um, to be part of this journey in the future, I think that is something very important. Can we, can we bear this in us to be a part of the journey in the future for the patient? And then maybe it's final question before it's up to you, and I'll stand up for this now, so you cannot get your mental uh, space ready for questions. Because um, Friedman, you, sh uh, you showed a lot of examples of the different forms of therapy that's are, that are offered in your hospital. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this earlier. I'm curious how you find, how do you find the right form of therapy? We discussed this also here before in previous sessions that obviously the music therapy doesn't work for everyone. A writing therapy doesn't work for everyone. Uh, I have a funny anecdote, a personal one a couple of years ago. 
I actually um, sent my mother, who's also in her 80s, to Havelhöhe. She went to all kinds of doctors and then stayed there for a week and went through all the medical research. But she did also the, you know, all the stuff that you showed there, you know, from oil and body and talking and this and that and, <laughs> and art therapy. And so she, she was sculpting something. My mother does not sculpt usually. But I think the one thing that totally stayed, and it's still at home in like a little, it's in the cupboard and very well preserved, is that little sculpture she made kind of of herself of sorts in the healing process. But I think that little thing of clay, it's like this big, is probably which the thing that she took with her that was the most, um, the most powerful element of the, I mean, she went through all the medical care and that was very well done. But it was this little thing, you could say banal clay thing that stayed at home and still for her represents something very, very personal and, um, and important. So, but anyways, how do you find that, that clay thing for you or whatever it is? Um, as my question, final question to you before you guys uh, ask your questions. Yeah, it's a very important question and sometimes not so easy. I can say what it should not be, uh, like a Speisekarte, uh, like a menu card mm. in a restaurant. Uh, today I'd like this one, oh, this one I don't like, I've never done, let's take this one. This should not be the aspect, but it's sometimes the aspect from the side of the patient. Mm. Uh, thinking it's a, it's a, a, a matter of, of, of like or not like. Actually, it should be a serious uh, way of uh, meeting the right indication. And sometimes, to be honest, not so easy, that's right. Uh, give you one very small, very short anecdote. Um, 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 I, I had a patient, again it was an elderly male patient and cancer, but very self-confident, very uh, um, in sich ruhend, uh, very calm in himself, yeah, uh, highly resilient factors. And, and then I said, yeah, it's usually tomorrow you go to psycho-oncology therapy, um, yeah, there's a, just an invitation to talk, uh, okay, he did, and then next day he asked me, do I have to go there once more? Uh, I, I said, yeah, normally it's two or three interviews, uh, can I stop it? And I said, why? And then he said, I think the lady has more problems than me. <laughs> <laughs> and why I'm trying to tell this, it might be true yeah. in this case, because he was not he was very healthy in his, in his psychological, emotional... Sense of coherence. Yeah, yeah. he was, uh, he was comprehend. he had a sense of coherence, it was obvious, although he was then, had a cancer problem. So that means, let, it's not sometimes not so easy to find the right thing, but doing it is a, as a teamwork. We have uh, weekly team discussions with the therapists, with the nurses, with the doctors, um, it's part of the procedure to find the right concept, mm. the right indication. How about you? Yeah, yeah the indication is not so easy. There's also contraindication. Yeah. Uh, I, I always ask my patients, they have, um, they have to go come to music therapy when they belong to a certain team, so they cannot choose very much. Uh, but I ask uh, them if they have any very negative experience with music. Um, and there, some people have very negative experience with music and they're traumatized. And when they're traumatized with music, with an instrument, with a music teacher, with some abuse experience with music, so they will not come to music therapy. Um, but um, my colleagues, they know if it's, it's about, um, how do you say, uh, resonance factors. Um, music therapy is very good because uh, about the sound, you come into a resonance uh, each other. When you're painting or art therapies, it's different. It's silent and you have uh, your paper and your colors and you're more with yourself. Uh, but music therapy, we always come together, playing together. And this is uh, the p patients, sometimes they are afraid. They think they cannot do that. But when they have this experience, group experience, they are so surprised and so astonished that they are able to feel a group, to feel com um, comfortable in, in a group. And a lot of people do not have this experience, this good group experience. Uh, we must be careful, but if people um, have very bad group experiences, music therapy can very be very nice, because with little sounds, they feel sort of part of a group. 
and yeah, but there are also contraindications, I agree. But uh, yeah, not always they can choose. Thank you. Okay, so um, now it's on you. First question, please. Um, and I have, I have to always repeat it for the online audience. By the way, online audience, wherever you are, you can also raise your virtual finger, but now. Yeah, um, uh, I have a question about, I think in Dr. Shard's presentation, you mentioned a st statistic from an experiment saying that people will live longer aren't engaging in an artistic process. Do you think this is because through creating the patients allow themselves to process emotions, relieving their body and mind of stress, or do you think it's because of other things that people tend to be? I'll repeat the question once for the online audience. Mm -hmm. um, this is referring to this pretty m amazing, actually, um, slide that you showed of the effect of the encounters or experience or participation in any artistic practice or cultural practices, how it kind of increases your likelihood of staying well, basically. So what do you believe are the factors behind it? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also the authors of that paper discussed it in the end. There are different ideas. There are, uh, for example, they looked, maybe it's the reason that those who are able to uh, go to these kind of cultural events, they are more mobile, they are fitter, they are less ill, or what other things. The morbidity factor was assumed to be lower, but uh, due to the stati statistics they did, that was not relevant. So uh, the answer is we don't know uh, what it does. And I think there's the, the, ro the, uh, the room is open mm. to discuss what are the healthy uh, uh, health supporting aspects of cultural activities. Yeah, and I think a lot, I mean, to my understanding, a lot has been mentioned by my colleague, which she discussed self-identity uh, and, and, and self-coherence, all these things might be important factors on our journey to more health. I thought it was amazing about this slide that there was even, there was no, not the social, uh, social demographic kind of aspect was not even of, of issue. That's pretty amazing. Uh, thank you. Another question. Who dares to go next? No shame in the game, guys. No, no such thing as a stupid question. You look like you want to ask? Yeah. Of course. Yes. Um, I think that if its process is not individual, uh, then it's not possible to make it productive. For example, I heard sounds, and these sounds was really annoying me, who, which I heard during the presentation. I become angry and frustrated. So. I can't like it because it's not for me. Actually, I hate violin, but I had uh, this. Uh, um, I was presented in a huge project when I was professional harp player, and she went ten harps, and she take all uh, young or like adult people and ask them to play several notes, and it was so huge harmony during several hours, and there was also a practice in art therapy and it was so untalented and uh, stupid done, and like these results were so bad. So actually I had sounds, but in this case it was very good. So I would make some tasting with different professionals and different uh, specific of instruments or art uh, directions. So it should be more expensive, more difficult, but if there will be testing system in this uh, like idea and beginning, then it will be more productive. Okay, so it's like more difficult than find a uh, like choose sexual partner. You can check, you can think that it's okay, but it's not okay. And but you can know and you can be really frustrated and annoyed and we work like if we work with like really people who needs healing and it could be dangerous so that where we stop not annoy them enough and make them angry and frustrated much more than they come to my therapy. For example, I can Oh, well, it's a good instrument, but for example, for somebody, it would be... Okay, like point, point taken, yeah. So um, the, question, yeah. the question there <laughs> had a lot of uh, dislikes <laughs> to certain types of music, but the point was, is there any form of, of kind of sound testing? So it goes similar to the question that I asked you before about how do you find out like which one works? Do you kind of test which sound, which music therapy works for whom? Is there anything like that? No. no. Um, 
um, we have so many instruments, and the patient, the person, uh, everybody chooses her or his instrument, favorite instrument. So uh, we have 50 instruments in the room, and I tell to the six people, uh, go and just choose the instrument you want to play now. And of course, maybe the person chooses for her or him the instrument which he likes, but there another person can choose an instrument which he or him does not like. So you have to work on the tolerance and to how can you change from hating an instrument and be more comfortable with it because violin is not violin because violin can be played in such a way or in another way. So the way how you learn to differentiate and to see things in different colors and not black or white. This is one of the processes we try to um, produce that people can be more tolerant with themselves and with others. If I understood your point right, uh, of course you can experience uh, a bad therapy session, of course. Uh, basically, it's up to the professionalism of the therapeut, of the therapy professional. And they are professional, they have qualified over years. We have seen the possibilities to qualify then actually what I understood uh, from you, this should be uh, looked at from the professional therapists and addressed and brought into a process as you are. And I'm, if I understood you right, individual therapy of course is very important, but I can tell you my experience that group therapy works as often very well as well. Somebody who is not comfortable with it, of course you can address him individually, but the group effect and the, the interaction effect, relation effect has been mentioned. Mm. It's helpful as well. Nice. Another question, yes, wonderful, thank you. Um. Yeah, nice uh, question. Um, the, the question is, in these different forms of therapy, what are your experience with those that kind of leave something? The example that I gave of my mother and this little sculpture she made, mm. whereas, for example, the example that you showed, you recorded it, but generally speaking, it's not being recorded. You make sounds in that moment, and after you leave the room, the sounds are gone. So between more ephemeral and more materially uh, realized um, objects, results, <laughs> there might be differences, as you pointed out. Uh, but I would say, uh, in the example of music therapy, um, when I go to the Philharmonie and enjoy an evening of violin concert, um, this might be sometimes um, nourish me for years. So there's something left which I cannot point on the wall, of course, or put it somewhere on the table, but um, if it works, if, if it's an ex inspiring movement or an inspiring evening moment or evening, I think you take something home as well, which can also take uh, hold on for long. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some patients, they say they found it, find it better that things pass away. Uh, that That's it's not, true. that it's immaterial. Uh, others, uh, I sometimes want to, um, how do you say, aufnehmen, record it, because I am so impressed sometimes by the music, but I know when I press and I record it, the music will not be the same, because people will not feel so comfortable. Um, so, um, yes, it's, it's a big difference, 
between the, I always yeah. say my my colleagues uh, who do art therapies and then after six weeks they have six paintings or ten paintings and the patient can look at uh, her first painting and as you showed at the last and the process and this is very difficult but I try to use my memory and to uh, give the uh, patient the feedback. Do you remember when you came first here, you were so shy and it was so difficult for you to to play, blah, blah, blah. And now uh, look at how you ended up. So I sort of observe and uh, um, yeah, through a feedback I try to do some musical memory with them. But um, but I think like you, even we don't play symphonies. So this uh, yeah. two minute or three minute playing improvisation is not so melodic as Beethoven. So sometimes it's difficult that the yeah. structure goes immediately into your mind. Um, but the people, they remember the important moments and they keep them. This is, I think this is true. When the first time they dare to play the piano or something like that, they always remember this. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the answers. Anna. So having two experts in, in practical application here, I wonder what is the time frame in which we see um, something, a, a, a change in the patient, a, a movement in his emotionality or so. Looking at psychotherapy, we speak about one year or one and a half, <laughs> which is a huge problem in our health system <laughs> because it blocks all the places. But what is about art therapy? Do you see something within a week or two weeks or what is the, and, and how is the, the development? Is it something like, like a curve or something linear? Um, what is your experience? Very good question. Yeah, very important yeah. question, yeah. of course. Uh, it's not uh, possible to answer this uh, in the whole in, in only two words, but basically first it's very individual. Secondly, yes, you see movements within five days or ten days. Sometimes not at all. Sometimes yes. Uh, yes, from the system of our uh, approach there should be actually a possibility to do this at home on an ongoing concept for eight weeks or six weeks or 12 weeks. Uh, some do, but you have in, 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 the, in, the, in art therapy or music therapy, one has to pay out of the pocket, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not um, covered by the insurances. On the other hand, on this field, many patients are going to other interventions like yoga, like Tai Chi, or like massage, or other things, uh, which are also out of the pocket to pay. And sometimes um, it's, I think it could be as well as important to go for art therapy or for music therapy as you go for other interventions. And um, in the end, what my experience is, um, I, I didn't. There's not. A, I didn't do a study on that, but um, we should. Um, sometimes it's only um, um, like to set an, a, a start, to to bring something into a movement, and uh, this can be um, aufgegriffen werden. This can be picked up uh, some weeks or some months later. So it is sometimes even only to give an impulse which can be picked up later by the patient. Yeah, but it's very, it's very important what you're asking for, it's true. Yeah, but I have also an idea, uh, an idea about that. I read in psychotherapy research, um, they found out that between eight and 12 sessions uh, already produce a sort of change, a little change. So it's better to have eight or 12 sessions than not to have sessions, even if the patient break up. And my doctor father was Kechele, you know, Horst Kechele. Yeah, and he's always said, oh, it's so impressing what you are doing in one session, psychoanalysts, we need 10 sessions. So he had a sort of scheme in his mind that is one to 10, the relationship. And I think uh, in, this, in the moment that people are doing, 
ähm, ist eine handelnde Therapie, ist a form of therapy, a creative therapy, a creative process. The patient um, can feel himself or herself, watch him herself, and there's, it's a sort of catalysator, you said before. Some, something is, is faster, I think, but even though I think at least half a year would be a good time, 20, 30 sessions to have a change which is solid and which <coughs> the patient then can go on working on it, to be aware of how the future could look like, as you call it. Mm -hmm. okay, let's check. Um, okay, let's, because we have not so much time to do these you two questions, and then, yeah, we come to an end. Uh, you go first. Uh, yeah. So, um, there are a lot of stereotypes about like, therapy, uh, especially uh, across uh, elderly people. So, it seems like it's not going to help, it's not like it's wasting enough time. So, like, uh, what's your approach? How do you fight with all stereotypes? And uh, for maybe what kind of communications or like what kind of this approach we can create uh, so people uh, to Actually, it's interesting. A similar question was asked last session. Uh, the question was the stereotypes on the sides of the patients. Oh, I'm not going to go to art therapy. I'm not going to do music therapy. I'm not going to do writing therapy. So there's, you mentioned the patients that are, can I, do I have to go again to? The, there was another reason, but how do you overcome the, these kind of um, biases, let's say, on the patient side towards such interventions? Yeah, of course, never ever body, anybody is forced to do anything. It's always an invitation. Uh, but still, uh, something is, uh, some, some situation is something sometimes a little bit more difficult if the patient himself is an artist or a, 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 a teacher in art. And you, you have a little bit to distinguish between his personal side and the professional side. So this is sometimes a little bit difficult. <laughs> and also sometimes uh, people say, I'm not Picasso. So they have this expectation of a professional result. And then you invite him to the opposite. It's not about the result, it's about the process. The process. And most of those people get, you, f you, you can invite them for this. Yes, and you can invite to just try out, come two or three times, and yeah. then you see. I think uh, these people have not only prejudices um, in, in front of therapies. I think these are people who are very, uh, who don't dare so much, who don't want to go into risks. Um, yeah, we just can invite them if they want to come and try out, and then you um, just see together with him or her what could he profit or what could be the benefit for him or her. Some of my patients, by the way, they, um, when they uh, finished music therapy, um, they um, want to have music classes uh, because when they were children they started music and then they're inspired by music therapy to come back to their instruments, which is very nice also because then you have the art and healing. Uh, no more music therapy, just music, the instrument and Gestaltung. And this is very nice. I play together with a band again. So this is normal music process. Music therapy is not normal, it's unnormal. Yeah, but it's a step into a normal, back to a normal life where art is very important. I think art is so important for the whole world. And if people would make more art, there would be less war, I think. I'm very sure about that. Mid, mid applause for this one, no? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Look, no, I meant it serious. Yes, yes. It's, it's cold in here. You gotta warm your hands. But um, Make you had another no question. More. That's our final question for the evening. No pressure. So, I have to repeat this again for the online audience. Sorry. Um, so, this was a question for Friedemann Schad regarding 
um, the slide that you showed of the different forms of art therapy or uh, in, uh, additional therapy forms in Havel Höhe, and in particular massage, the body work, was used by almost, uh, according to the statistic, 100% of the patients in oncology, so cancer treatment, um, uh, having these um, massage therapies. Why? Uh, this little study was on breast cancer patients, specialized in the gynecology department. But nevertheless, uh, massage plays an important role in oncological treatment. In oncological treatment, generally, you are right, uh, even in palliative care and in uh, Sterbebegleitung, in uh, end-of-life care treatment, massage is very important. How to do this in two sentences? Uh, um, cancer, from the first moment of the diagnose, questions your identity, uh, questions your future. Am I dying? Why me? What have I done wrong? What should I have changed in my life? How can I overcome? All these questions are there within a second, within a weekend. And there is one aspect. Can I regain deep trust in myself? A deeper way of trust in my body. Does my body bear myself in the future? Yes or no? And this part to address these, uh, I would say, non-verbal, deeper layers of ourselves, this can be done by wrist by massage. Mm. You cannot talk, relax, feel more self-confident, uh, be the one who you are, or whatever. You cannot address this verbally so easy. Maybe you have some time, maybe you have the, the chance to have a very good talk with the patient and you can gain this layer as well, but basically it's a non-verbal interaction. And that's why I like so much this multimodal uh, aspect. You can address different levels. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Reminds me you showed also, or you said that well, each individual is complex, cancer is very complex. Um, this whole topic we're engaging is very complex and uh, maybe to close off, not with a medical expert, but with a filmmaker, and there's this, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, Godard, Jean Godard said something like, why simple if you can do it complex? And that's just referring to, there is a great complexity in our life and we have to address that and not kind of simplify things. That said, please a warm applause to our two wonderful guests tonight. Thank you for all the wonderful food for thought. Applause to you. Thank you for coming. It's, uh, I learned again a lot tonight. It's our second to last session, so in two weeks is going to be our final session for this semester. And we will have um, two guests. One is uh, Dr. Ada Pimoradi Sehuli, who has uh, studied cultural studies, sciences, and medicine, and is working at the Charité. And we have um, Professor Natasha Kelly, who is the Professor for Cultural Studies here at the uh, um, UDK for the Studium Generale currently. And it's going to be a lot about literature and therapy, so writing therapy uh, as, a, as a practice. Anyways, thanks again. Wonderful evening. Enjoy the week. Thank you.